Hi, my name is Nigel. I'm the presenter for the day. Uh, welcome to Sunshine Courses. This is the accounting course that's going to deal with uh, accruals, prepayments and expenses. So it's a module that supplements the full accounting course, which is available on the sunshine.courses website. So what we're going to cover today is the principles and accounting of accruals, the principles and accounting of prepayments, and then we're going to go through some practical tips on expenses and some practical tips on income as they relate to accruals and prepayments. And just before we get started, just a quick reminder that the whole purpose of accounting is to try and make sense of all the receipts and payments that go through a business. And when we say make sense of, what we mean is identify the assets and liabilities at the beginning of an accounting period, a month, a quarter, or a year, for example, and then identify the profits and losses accounts we make during the month. And that, if we've done everything correctly, should give us the assets and liabilities at the end of the month. And one of the key challenges, therefore, with an accounting is to identify which month is the relevant month within which to account for receipts and payments. And the reason it's a big deal is if we account for income in one month and the related costs in another month, if we do not match, if we fail to match the income and the expenses, in the month in which we've shown the income, it looks like we've done really well in the month. And in the month in which we record the expense, it looks like we're doing really badly, when actually how well we're doing is the difference between the income and expenses. So a big uh, amount of effort is spent in accounting to make sure the, both the income and the expenses are recorded in the correct accounting period. And we define the correct accounting period by reference not to the month in which cash flows, so you do not choose a month by reference to when you receive money for an income or pay money for an expense. You may do, but that's not the defining point. The defining point is the date on which you receive or you deliver your goods or services. So if you deliver goods or you receive goods in the month of February, you need to make sure the income that relates to those goods is recorded in the same period. And if you have to choose one or the other, the priority of income over expenses is everything revolves around the income. So the first thing you do is identify which month the income is delivered or received. The goods or services are, de are, are received, that's, or delivered, I should say. That's the month in which the income should arise. And the month in which the expenses arise should be the same month that the income that it relates to arises. And if the cash flows or the expenses are recorded in different accounting periods for any reason, we need to create some accounting journals so that we match, or we move the costs into the same month as the revenues. And just occasionally, if the revenues are in the wrong month, and we'll talk about that a bit later, you might need some journals to switch that as well. Okay, so the basic concept of accruals and prepayments is all about matching our income and expenses in the correct accounting period, where the cash flows or the expenses take place in a different month. So let's look at accruals first. Accruals is what we call uh, is the accounting entries that relate to invoices or expenses that occur in a future month where we haven't yet received the invoice. So if we received it, so in this example, in the month of February, we have our income, that's why we want the expense to be in the month of February. Uh, we have some income in the month of February, but what we're showing here is that the expense itself should arise in February. But the invoice we don't receive until March. So as at the end of February, 
if we don't make an accounting journal, we won't be showing the expense in February, even though we received goods or services in February. So the idea of an accrual is to identify what the invoices will be that we receive in a future month and put through a journal so that we account for the expense in the month in which it relates to, not necessarily the month it's received. So imagine that we've got, for example, a telephone bill. Throughout the month of February, we go through and make a lot of phone calls, do texting. And at the end of February, our telephone company charges. It might take them a few days to get their invoice out to us. So the invoice comes to us in the month of March. Yet we've actually used the service, we've actually used the telephone throughout the month of February. So unless we do something, although we've incurred expenses in February, nothing will be recorded in February. That's the principle. So how does the, this work in practice? We put through a journal in February and the journal says, create the liability of accruals, even though we don't have a creditor. If we had got an invoice and recorded it in February, we'd have recorded the creditor and it would have been debit, telephone, credit, creditors, that's the normal entry. But no, we haven't received the invoice. So we're gonna create a separate entry. Instead of saying credit creditors, we're gonna credit accruals. And accruals is the accounting way to say, we haven't yet received the invoice. And the reason we want to distinguish accruals from uh, invoices is typically the invoice becomes due only after it's been received. So if you've got an accrual, it means you won't have to pay that amount quite as quickly as if it was a creditor. There's another thing with accruals is that if you haven't yet received the invoice when you're doing the journal, you might have to guess what that invoice is likely to be. So if we're doing our accounts halfway through the month, and we've already, uh, halfway through the month of March, we're gonna do the February accounts, we've already had the invoice by the time we do the accounts, we know exactly what the telephone bill will be. But if we haven't yet received the invoice, let's say we're doing the accounts within three or four days of the end of February, and the invoice only comes in in a week and a half's time, we haven't yet received it, we have to guess or estimate what the telephone bill is likely to be. So the point of an accrual is it's uh, often, it's an estimate rather than actual liability. And the liability will arise at some stage in the future. And of course, if we make a mistake in the estimate, if we over or underestimate, that will be accounted for in future months because there's no other way of managing it. But in this, in the month of February, we've incurred costs. We, we believe there'll be 1,200 pounds. So the entry will be credit accruals, that's the liability, debit, the profit and loss account item, expense item of telephone. And in this way, even though we haven't received an invoice, in the month of February, we can still account for the expense in February. I'm gonna show you this in an accounting system. And we use the accounting software of KPM. Um, it's a typical accounting system. There are lots of other accounting systems that you can use. The principles are all the same. And at the moment, I've got no entries in these accounts because I want to show you the impact of setting up the accrual. So I'm going to put through the, uh, uh, I'm just gonna show you, I'm gonna do a quick report on the profit and loss account. At the moment, there's nothing, no receipts and no payments. So in the month of, uh, in the month of February, there's nothing. And in the month of March, there's nothing. I'm doing these accounts during the month uh, for February at the first week in March. And I haven't yet had the invoice from the telephone company. So I'm gonna put through a journal. And the journal I'm gonna put through I'm going to add a new journal. The date is the 28th of February. And I'm going to say accrual for telephone. If I had a document which 
um, from which I'd made my estimate, I would actually put the reference number to that document rather than the description in the reference. But because I don't have anything, I'm going to say accrual in February, accrual for telephone charge in February. And the um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to debit, we said it was 1200 pounds. I'm going to debit telephone. And the description is telephone charges, in, uh, is accrual for telephone charges in February. Debited telephone. I'm going to add a new line and I'm going to credit accruals. Accrued expenses. Same description. And my balance sheet balances, the debits equal the credits. So I've got my double entry. I'm just going to save this now. And now let's have a look at the February accounts. I'm going to look at the profit and loss account. And I'm going to go back to the end of February. So my accounts are from the 1st of April 2020 to the 28th of February, February 2021. And look, it's got no income because the only entry I've got is £1,200 for the telephone, fax and internet. That's the journal I just put through. Note, we haven't yet had the invoice, but we've still got the expense through in February because we put the accrual through. Let's have a quick look at the balance sheet. And in the balance sheet, our creditors of less than a year, we show accrued expenses of £1,200. And that balance is against the net current loss of £1,200 because that's the only transaction we've had in the year. And this is the balance sheet. So our net liabilities equal to our net loss in this particular case. Anyway, we're quite happy that our accrues, accruals are £1,200. Now, we're going to jump through to March and we're going to show you what happens in March when we record the expense. So we're going to get our invoice and the invoice, I'm going to click purchases, the invoice is received, let's say on the 10th of March, why not? I don't know if I've got a supplier, I'm going to call it Lighter Supplies, not a good name for a telephone company, that's all I got at the moment. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to show um, telephone charges for February. And I've got a reference number, and I'm going to put the reference number to the invoice itself. And I have an invoicing, uh, an invoicing reference system, which is based on the year and the month. And then I put a, a digit to represent the order in which I'm filing it. And if I went to my filing cabinet, which might be electronic or it might be physical, if I look 2103.1, I'd very quickly find the invoice itself. So that's my audit trail. So I put the main, the name of the supplier, the reference number and the due date. Um, telephone charge for February. The amount was, I'm gonna say, when we received the invoice, even though we accrued 1200 pounds, I'm gonna say the invoice was actually 1300 pounds. So we'd under accrued. And I want to show you how the accounting system manages the shortfall. And the account is telephone. So that's the double, so that's the double entry. We credit credit as debit telephone, 1300 pounds. Uh, that's correct. The amount is 1300 pounds. Um, and in this case, I'm going to show that we've, uh, I'm gonna show that the amount, rather than adding it to trade creditors, I'm going to assume that there's a direct debit where they've charged money directly to our bank account. So instead of going to creditors, it comes out of the bank account. So even though this is in the purchaser system, the entry will be debit telephone, 1300 pounds, credit bank, 1300 pounds. So let's save this. Uh, I've, got a, I've got to deal with VAT um, and um, uh, we're going to deal with VAT in a different module. 
So I'm not going to explain about the VAT now. But so what I've now done is I've entered that entry. Let's have a quick look at the profit and loss account for the month of March only. So for the current month, from the 1st of March to the 10th of March. Good, it's showing telephone of 1300 pounds. But remember, we've already accounted for 1200 pounds last month. So something's wrong. Let me have a quick look at our balance sheet and see what's going on within the balance sheet. In the balance sheet, our bank account is showing that we've got an overdraft of £1,300 because the only transaction we've had ever since we started is the telephone company has withdrawn £1,300 from our bank. So it's correct, we've got an overdraft of £1,300. But we've also got accruals, as at the 10th of March, of £1,200 when actually we no longer have to accrue any expenses because we've already paid for it. So we have to clear the accrual because we no longer need it as at the end of March, or in this case, even at the 10th of March, because we've received the invoice, we no longer have to accrue for it. So I want to remo remove this accrual. So what do I do? Let me go back to my journals. And, and I'm gonna add a new journal in the month of uh, the month of March, this time it's the 10th of March. Typically I would do this at the end of the month. So I'd probably put the 31st of March, but I'm gonna say reverse February accrual because it's no longer needed. And I could put more detail if I wanted to. In the journal, I could put more details to take me back to the documents from which I get to this figure. And in this case, I'm gonna debit accruals uh, reverse the February accrual. I'm going to debit accruals with the amount I accrued, which is £1,200. Not the £1,300 that was paid, the amount I accrued was £1,200. That's what I'm reversing. I debit accruals because I'm reducing the liability, and the liability is a credit, so reducing a liability must be a debit. And the other side, the double entry is to telephone, I'm going to put the same um, description here. Again, I could put a more meaningful description if, if I needed to. Again, £1,200 is the other side. My journal balances, debits and credits equal each other. So I'm going to save and close this. And now let's have a look at the balance sheet again, the profit and loss account. I'm going to look at the profit and loss account for February. So in February, even though we've put all the adjustments through, we still have costs of 1,200 pounds because nothing's changed in February. What's changed is March. Let's look at the current month. In the current month, the telephone and fax costs is now 100 pounds. Even though we'd already accrued for it last month, and the reason that 100 pounds, which relates to calls from last month, is recorded in the month of March. So even though these are February costs, we've closed the February accounts. And in the month of March, we've picked up that we had under accrued for expenses last month. Because we've closed last month's accounts, we can't go back and change last month's accounts. If we had done last month's accounts, when we knew how much the phone bill was, we could then go back and make the accrual the correct amount but we couldn't, and the whole point of accruals is you don't know what the figures are. So if you've over or under accrued in the previous month, the, the cost, the over or understatement of the cost is put through in the current month's account or whenever you find out about it. And the reason for that is if we were being literal or absolute in our matching concepts, this hundred pounds relates to costs from the previous month. But there's a concept in accounting that you can just do the best you can do. And if you make an estimate, which is the best you can do, and it subsequently turns out the estimate is wrong, you correct the estimate at the first opportunity and the income or the cost is put through to the profit and loss account in the month in which you become aware that that estimate is wrong. So it's different from the, account, from the matching concept. And the reason of course for that is, can you imagine if you had a set of accounts and every month 
the previous month's accounts kept changing because you kept finding out about new estimates. Eventually, you'd never be able to make it head or tail of what those previous set of accounts actually was because it would keep changing. So that's why we don't do this in accounting purposes. Let me now go back to the um, balance sheet. Now the balance sheet for the month of March, I got my bank account overdraft of 1300 pounds. Notice I no longer got any accruals because I reversed it. And again, my balance sheet balances because my net loss is 1300 pounds relative to my overdraft of 1300 pounds. Remember the net loss, I'm gonna go back to the profit and loss account. My net loss for the whole period from beginning of the financial year to the 10th of March is 1300 pounds. But last month was 1200 pounds and this month was 100 pounds. So this is how we account for accruals. And this illustrates the principle that if we over or underestimate the accrual, it doesn't matter because the accounting system naturally picks up the differences and accounts for it at the first period in which we can do so. So back to the accrual journal, the um, accrual for the journal, which is in the month of February, debit telephone credit accrual. Not remembering in March, we need to reverse that accrual. And of course, put through another accrual for the month of March, if there's expenses in the month of March that we haven't yet accounted for. So that's the principles of accruals. Let's now switch to the principles of prepayments. So prepayments are almost the diametric opposite of accruals. It's all to do with matching the expenses to the month in which the expense relates to the income. And in this example, we have a rent bill, a six month rent bill that we pay in January. And the bill that we pay in January relates to six months, but as at the end of January, five of those six months hasn't yet been enjoyed. So in the month of January, we've spent, we've cost, the cost of our business is uh, a sixth of the six months bill. And at the end of January, five sixths of that bill hasn't yet been enjoyed. And under the matching process, we're going to defer the expenses we paid in January for those five months to future months. That's the principle of a prepayment, is that whatever the expense is, we defer, we reduce the cost in that month that relate to future months and transfer them to future months. So a prepayment is the way expenses are recorded, where, invoice, where the invoice has been invoiced in advance. Apologies for the text on here, I need to update it. So the accounting journal for this, imagine we've spent, we've got a bill for 600 pounds, rental bill for 600 pounds that we pay in January. Or oh, in this case, we paid it in the month of February. We've paid the six uh, months in February and it relates to the six months to the 31st of July. And at the moment, our accounts show a cost of 600 pounds in the month of February, but actually five of that 600 pounds relates to future months. So the journal we put through is we debit prepayments. The prepayments of the balance sheet item is an asset because it's a benefit for future periods. It's a debit, it's a debtor, sorry, it's a debit rather, debit balance. And the other side is credit rent. Remember, rent as an expense is normally a debit item in the profit and loss account. We're crediting it because we're reducing the rent by 500 pounds in the month of February. And we'll see how we'll then release it in due course. 
So let's see what that looks like in practice. So I'm just going to show, uh, put through a quick entry to show that in the month of, uh, in the month of, um, uh, gonna, uh, in the month of February, I'm going to call it February rent again. If we were um, uh, doing this properly, I'd put an audit trail back to the document that this relates to, which most likely would be the invoice. I'm going to say we've paid to our customer, um, to our supplier. Let's say the grant traders is our, is our landlord. Um, I put through the reference of 2102.5, that's the reference back to the document. Um, it's for the, we, we, um, um, we're going to treat this as rent. Sorry, the reason uh, the accounting system had stopped is that I put a, a, a customer and if I've got a customer, I can't charge an, an expense account to a customer. So the software was, was preventing me doing that. So just ignore the customer. But I've got a rental bill. Um, let's say I'm going to call it Landlord Limited. Rent for six months from 1 Feb to 30 July 2021. So that's the description. And the invoice date was the 1st of February. The amount was 600 pounds. And I'm going to say this comes from the, uh, and I'm going to say this comes from the bank account. So I've simply recorded a rental payment on the 1st of February of 600 pounds. And the entries are debit rent 600 pounds, credit bank account or the fact that this is a payment, that's how the system knows how to record this. So let's save this. Let's now have a look at the February accounts again. I'm gonna go for the last month, which is February. Now look, we've got the rent of 600 pounds. We've still got our telephone cost from the previous um, example we did, but our rent is wrong because it's correct that we paid 600 pounds but only 100 of that 600 relates to the month of February. 500 relates to future months. So let's put through a journal to defer the 500 pounds that relates to future months, or to match that 500 pounds against the revenues that we're going to earn, hopefully, in that month, in those future months. So the, here's the journal. Again, we're going to call it a journal to be the journal of the 28th of February, because we're doing it as at the month end. Um, again, I put in some sort of type of reference. In this case, the reference, I can say for prepayments. But I might have a more meaningful um, uh, reference back to a document where I got all my figures from. In the account, I'm going to debit prepayments. This is um, rental rent for the five rent for five months from one March to thirty one July five hundred pounds. So I've set up my prepayment of rent for five months. I got add a second line, and this the credit is going to go to rent. I'm going to credit 500 pounds. So this was the entry that we just talked about, debit, prepayments, credit, rent. My journal balances, so that's my double entries done properly. I'm going to save and close this. Let's have now have a look at the balance sheet, uh, the profit and loss account for the previous, uh, for the month of February. And this time it shows our rent, which showed beforehand as 600 pounds, has reduced to 100 pounds. So we now got the correct rent, the, the our estimate of rent of 1,200 pounds. It was the best we could come up with at the time in which we prepared the accounts. And we've got our rent, which we know accurately we paid 600 pounds, but 500 of that relates to future months. So what's left is the 100 pounds that relates to the month of February, 
So I'm now happy that my expenses match whatever income I've got for the period. Let's have a quick look at the balance sheet just to see what happens on the balance sheet. So in the balance sheet, at the end of February, I've paid my 600 pounds to, to the landlord for the rent. So my bank's overdraft is 600 pounds. Haven't paid anything to the telephone company, but I've accrued 1200 pounds for them. But I prepaid 500 pounds, my prepayments that we've discussed, those are expenses that I'm deferring to future months. Again, my balance sheet balances because my total, my net assets, net liabilities of the prepayments of 500 pounds, my overdraft of 600 pounds, my accrual of 1200 pounds, the net of those three figures is 1300 pounds, and that equals my profit and loss account. So I'm, without many further journals, let me now look at the month of uh, March. And look at the end of March, although this is the 10th of March, but the end of March, my prepayments are still 500 pounds. And in the month of March, on my, if I look at the profit and loss account, I don't have anything in here. Let's go through the current month. I don't have anything here for rent. I've got my 100 pounds for telephone. That's the under accrual from last month, but I've got nothing for rent. So in the month of March, I've got to do something to adjust my prepayment, which is no longer valid to carry five months forward and to create the cost. So I'm gonna put through a journal that reverses part of my prepayment. So let's go and do that now. I'm gonna create a new journal. And this time I'm gonna call it March Prepayments. And in this case, Um, in this case, I'm going to reduce my, um, uh, I'm going to release one month's worth of rent from the prepayment. So I'm going to reduce my prepayments. Prepayments are a debit, so by reducing it, to reduce it, I have to credit it. And the other side goes to rent. And I've got a, if I've credited prepayments, I've got a debit rent. So let's save and close this. And let's now have a look at the balance sheet and profit and loss account. And the profit and loss account for the month of, let's do the current month only, for the month of March, I've now got rent of £100 and telephone of £100. And on the rent, I haven't spent any more money because I paid the money in the month of February. But even though I paid for it in February, it relates to the month of March. And because I had carried my prepayments forward, I'm able to release the prepayment for the month of March to get my rental costs. So now I've got correctly showing this expense. Let's have a quick look at the balance sheet. In the balance sheet, my prepayments have gone down to 400 pounds. And now correctly, my bank account is 1900 pounds, which is the 1300 pounds we paid to the bank. Uh, to the telephone company, 600 pounds to the landlord, that was the 1900 pounds, but I still got prepayments at the end of the month of 400 pounds. So now I'm going to go through to the month of, um, month of April. The balance sheet was showing if there's no other transactions at the month of April shows prepayments of 400 pounds. What I'm now going to describe to you is the process by which you account for prepayments and accruals. As at the end of April, we've got prepayments of 400 pounds. We need to know what those prepayments are. If we look back in our records, we've got audit trail back to tell us what that prepayments are. And it shows us the prepayments relate to telephone. And the prepayments relate to telephone, another four months worth of costs from March through to the end of July. But we're now at the end of April and prepayments are no longer valid to be 400 pounds. But when we look at the figures, they're only 300 pounds of prepayments we can carry forward. So the mechanics of us doing this exercise is we look at the balance sheet and we identify are the balances in our balance sheet valid, still valid? 
And we can only identify that by knowing what the prepayments are and then to reassess if they're still valid as at the end of April in this case. And if it's not valid, we'll put through a journal to correct it. And there are two ways you can put through a journal. One journal, which is what we just did, is to put through just the change. We'll just reduce prepayments at the end of April by another hundred pounds. We credit prepayments, 100 debit rent, 100 pounds. We could do that. We could also, and it might seem a bit strange to do this, we could also reverse all our prepayments. So whatever we put through for the previous month's prepayments, reverse the whole amount. So in this case, it would be credit prepayments of 400 pounds, debit telephone, for, uh, sorry, debit rent 400 pounds, and then put through a separate journal, say we've got 300 pounds left in prepayments and put through the whole of the prepayments at the end of April. So that would be, uh, debit rent 300 pounds credit, sorry, debit prepayments 300 pounds credit rent 300 pounds. And the reason, although it might seem a bit strange, the reason you might want to do that is that sometimes it's easier just to clear out everything that's in there beforehand and start again from scratch. Well, the choice is yours, whichever's easier for you, it doesn't really matter because they both have the same effect. But what is important is you go through your, your balance sheet and you identify if the prepayments are still valid. So let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so our prepayment was debit prepayment 500 credit rent and we've just seen how that works. This is the end of February and at the end of March we updated that to, to release another month of the rent, and we'll keep doing that until we get to the end of the rental period. So for the rest of this uh, module, I'm gonna go through some practical expenses and a couple of income items as well, so that you can understand in practice how this works. And the majority of the discussion is not so much about the expenses themselves, but to identify the correct accounting period in which you want to account for them. And then we've already got, once you know what the correct accounting period is, depending on the date in which the invoice came through relative to the date that the expense relates to, you've got the option of either using an accrual or a prepayment to move the um, month in which the accounting entry will take place back to the month in which the transaction should be recorded according to the uh, intended, the, the, the correct period for accounting purposes. The month in which the goods or services were received relative to the income that the goods or services delivered. So general point accruals. One of the big, easiest ways of making a mistake in accounting is to forget to record invoices or, or expenses. It's very easy to record uh, sales, it's, it's, um, uh, but, uh, but the expenses that relate to it, if a creditor has sent through an invoice to you, you usually have a physical document or an email with that amount and it's, relatively easy to remember to pick all of those up. You don't need a particularly sophisticated system to work out how you account for all the invoices that come through. But there's quite a number of cases where invoices don't come through. We've already looked at the telephone costs, for example. Um, the telephone companies often bill in arrears. Same thing happens with um, utilities. Same thing happens with a number of other um, items. But as a generic point, if you haven't had an invoice, sometimes it's difficult to know that there's a cost. So imagine, for example, there are some employees of the company and they've gone out and spent money and they're gonna claim it back from us a month later. There's no way we would know that they spent the money unless they tell us in advance and some accounts is required. Sometimes the only way to know what an accrual will be as at the end of the month is to look through the expenses that you paid in the following months. 
So sometimes you want to delay preparing accounts, not because you're being lazy or because you're just too busy, but because sometimes you need to make sure that you've picked up enough of the uninvoiced in uninvoiced charges or costs. And sometimes the only way to do that is to look at subsequent payments or subsequent invoices. So whenever you're doing accounts, always look at what you have, whatever you've paid, or whatever you've invoices you've had in, in between the end of the month and the date at which you're doing your accounts and identify any expenses that relate to the month in which you're doing your accounts. And any unbilled or uninvoiced, unrecorded invoices, if they're dated in the pre, if the invoice date is from the previous month, by all means go through and put it through as a creditor dated the previous month, but otherwise put it through as an accrual as at the end of the previous month. Remember the accrual was debit cost credit accruals. And that works fine if you've got enough time period. But what happens if, and quite often I do this with charity accounts I'm doing, I want the people who are running the charities to know very quickly how much money they've got in the bank and where they spent the money. So if you want timely accounts, you need a more sophisticated way to pick up invoices that haven't yet come through. And there are several ways of doing it. One example would be to request that anybody who's incurring an expense always sends you an invoice when they put through an order. Sorry, not an invoice, some sort of notification, a purchase order system or, a, or a, a copy of the order that they put through by email, for example. So that way you can just keep track of them. And if you haven't yet received an invoice, you can then accrue for it at the end of the month. Or if you budget your expenses, you can see if your budget, if your expenses for the month are below budget or above budget, or you can sometimes compare to the previous month or the previous year. That's what we call a reasonableness review. You just look, is, does it look a reasonable amount by reference to what you're expecting in the budget or what you paid last month or what you paid in the same month last year? And these are all techniques for picking up uninvoiced amounts. And if you pick up any uninvoiced amounts, you can only do the best you can in estimating. So you'll put through your estimate. I'd suggest you always go back to the people from the business who are incurring the expense in the first place. They're much likely, they're more likely to have a better estimate than you'll be have. So get the estimate from them, put through the accrual, um, and in the following month or months, if it turns out your estimate was wrong, as we've seen, when you put through the actual figure and then reverse the accrual, the difference, the under accrual or over accrual would be adjusted for in the month in which it's recorded. So unbilled invoices or generally accruals, it's a generic thing. It's a really worthwhile putting effort into that because it's so easy to get incorrect accounts by simply forgetting to put through expenses. Okay, next one, rents. Whenever you've got a rent account, sometimes people pay rent monthly, but very often rents are paid in advance. And if you pay rent in advance, go back to the cost. If you're looking through your management accounts and you haven't yet finalized the accounts, look at the account of rent, look through the general ledger account of rent, look at each of the items in there, and see if the accounting period relates to the month in which you're doing the accounts. So if you're doing accounts in the month of February, so you're in March, you're accounting for the month of February, look at whatever's recorded in rents and see if any of the costs relate to a future period. And if so, put through the prepayment. We've seen how to do that already. So that's quite easy, really. Leases can be a little bit more complicated because often with leases, you might have to pay money up front in order to, um, to uh, make sure you've got the property to contract having the property for the next year or two or three. Not all leases ask for money up front, but some leases are, uh, require a premium. And if there's a premium in a lease, let's say you're taking out a new contract for a rent of say two years, and the rent will be say a hundred pounds a month, but you've got to pay a premium 
of 1200 pounds in addition the month that you take the contract out is when you pay the lease premium but that premium relates to rent over the two-year period so even though the lease premium is not rent it still relates to benefits you're going to receive that's the rental property uh, rent over a two-year period that's the period during which you're going to receive your income so you need to spread the lease premium over the life of the lease this two-year period in the same way that if we paid rent in advance we have to defer that to the correct premium okay correct period so i just want to identify that leases lease premiums are not that dissimilar from rents typically a lease premium will have a lot more money in it than prepayments and if the lease relates to a period of not three to six months but say four to five years then because the lease premium you're paying lasts for more than a year we'd probably put that in fixed assets to distinguish the current pre current um prepayments the, the current period from the more long term uh, over the one year period so leases uh, are worth checking if you paid any leases utilities utilities are things like light and heat um electricity bills for the for the internet um uh, lots of water bills you really need to check through each of the utilities as to which period period it relates to but different companies have different policies as to when they charge so i'm afraid with utilities there's no substitute for going back to the invoice that you've recorded in your accounts and seeing which accounting period it relates to and if in the month of february you've paid an invoice and that relates to january costs then you can guess you need to accrue for february's costs and you can often use the january the amount you accrued in that you paid in respect of january in the month of february to, for the month of february's charge so if you've got a, a, a an electricity bill in february that relates to the month of january and you paid say 500 pounds of that bill and you want to know how much to accrue at the end of february for february's costs which we'll receive in march if there's enough time to wait and you've had the march bill and the March bill happens to be 450 pounds if you've had the bill you can accrue 450 pounds as at the end of february because you know exactly how much it is if not you may say look if i paid 500 pounds in january my best guess is i'll pay 500 pounds in february i'll accrue 500 pounds so you may use the same figure you may say well actually it wasn't so cold in february we spent less money on heating so i'm going to reduce it but you just make your your best estimate whatever estimate you make i suggest you record the basis of your estimate somewhere when you're recording the uh, accrual make an audit reference put the reference down as an audit trail back to the document where you made your assessment so somebody who's a future day said well why did you make this estimate what was the basis of this estimate you can go back and tell them what the estimate was i can almost guarantee that you won't remember it in say four or five months time and it's quite possible that you'll really need to know the basis of the estimate to see if something else is correct so that's the strong suggestion put write down the basis of your estimate and make sure your audit trail or your reference number allows you to go back to to find it at some stage in the future but it's just as possible the utility company will have charged you in advance so some companies say i'm not going to give you any credit i'm going to charge you for what i think your electricity is going to be next month pay me adjust it in the next month and if that's the case you need to put through a prepayment because you paid money before you've received the goods or services so for utilities you have to go back to the invoices to identify the correct accounting period and put through either a prepayment or accrual depending on whichever um, period has been account uh, been invoiced insurance is the next item insurance tends to be uh, in, on one year basis and typically it's one year in advance so if you paid insurance look at the insurance bill see which period it relates to as likely as not it'll relate to a prepayment and if you've 
um, paid insurance in the month of February for the period of February through to the following January, then at the end of February, you'd have prepayment of 11 months of that bill. What happens in the month of February, if you've actually taken out insurance from January through to the end of December, but you didn't know in January how much the bill was gonna be, so you hadn't recorded anything. So in the month of February, we pay our insurance bill for a year, but in the month of February, the whole of that charge relates to the year, the 12 months to the end of December. How much do we record in the month of February? Because we know that within that full expense, only one month relates to February. Well, let's look at the prepayment first. At the end of February, we've prepaid 10 months worth of rent only, 10 months, not 11 months. So when we set up the prepayment, we've only got 10 months that we can prepay. So that means our invoice cost that we paid in February for 12 months is reduced by 10 months, which means in the month of February, our costs are gonna be two months worth of insurance. Well, you say, hold on, that can't be right because one of those two months relates to January, so we should adjust the January accounts. Well, this comes back to the principle I was telling you beforehand. If we haven't yet finalized the January accounts, um, excuse me a second. If we haven't finalized the January accounts, um, then we can go back and adjust them. But if we've um, uh, already finalized the January account, we didn't know about the insurance, we hadn't accrued for the cost at that stage. The first we know about it is in February. So the reason we put, so we would write it off in February because that's the first time we can do so, even though the expense relates to the previous month. In accounting, if you're doing this on, a, on an annual basis, if the error, the under accrual is so significant that the previous year's accounts are actually now misleading, there's actually a way for dealing with this and you might adjust the accounts through something called a prior year adjustment. But that's quite a big deal and generally you wouldn't do it. So unless there's a lot riding on it or there's a huge amount of money or there's some compelling reason why you need to draw management's attention to the fact that you've done this, if that's not the case, you generally write off the cost in the month that you first find out about it. And in this case, we only know about it in the month of February. Perhaps we should have accrued for it in January. Perhaps we should have known that insurance was due. Um, we should have made some guess or accrual for it, but we didn't do so. so. The first we can do so is in the month of February. And that's why in the month of February, we've got two months worth of costs coming through all at the same time. Okay, salaries is the next item. This is really, I just want to illustrate the principle of matching where it reaches its limit. So that remember the matching is where you're taking a cost that relates to a future or past revenue. So let's say we have got some salaries and during the month, some of the salaries go off to pay some admin costs. And let's say the admin costs happen over, um, over a three month period, we've got admin costs in January, February, and March. So our total salaries, let's say is 3,000 pounds for those three months. In January, we have bumper sales of 10,000 pounds and we have nothing at all in January, in February or March. The question I'm asking is, should the salaries that we pay in February or March relate to January? Actually, let me switch it round. Let me say we have no sales in January or February, but we have sales in the month of March. So we've got salaries in January, February, and March, no sales in January or February, but we do have sales in the month of March. The question is, should we Pre treat those salaries as a prepayment against future revenues. 
That's the question. And the answer is no, unless those salaries directly relate to the revenue. The answer is no, unless the salaries directly relate to the revenue. So if we're doing administration, we're managing our rental payments, we're managing our insurance, we're paying our suppliers, we're paying our customer, we're collecting debts from our customers. We've got a whole load of administrative things we need to do to keep the business going. If we don't have any revenues in January or February, we've just lost money. It's just tough. It's one of those things. And in March, we have a bumper month simply because we've sold a lot in the month of March. But what happens if the salary is related directly to the revenue. So imagine, for example, that we're, uh, we're building a, a house and the salaries that we paid out are not administrative costs, but they're builders costs to build the house. So at the end of January, we spent a thousand pounds against this 10,000 pounds of sales. And that sales relates to the building of which we just put a thousand pounds in terms of salaries. There'll be a lot other expenses in there as well. The same three is true in February. Well, in that case, we do carry the salaries forward. And that's what's treated called work in progress, stock and work in progress. And there's a separate module that specifically deals with stock and work in progress. The reason I wanted to deal with it here is I wanted to identify that there's a limit to the matching concept, even though all our sales with the benefit of hindsight come through in March, don't defer the admin costs in January and February because they don't directly relate to that revenue. So the next lot of expenses, uh, computer expenses. Computer expenses uh, are a bit challenging in, in certain circumstances. Imagine you're going out and buying some laptops or some PCs those will last you two or three years. Should we carry those costs forward? Are they a prepayment? Actually, those items are fixed assets. We've got a separate module on fixed assets, but if you go and buy assets that last for two or three years, you treat them as fixed assets and you apportion the cost in a variety of different ways. You can either write it off equally over the life of the, of the assets or on a number of different areas. Go and have a look at the fixed asset module for different ways that you can write off the cost. But for fixed assets, yes, you do carry those computer expenses forward. What about if we're, say, paying internet, uh, um, uh, the internet service charges? We're paying charges to be able to access the internet, the telephone charges. Should we carry those forward or are they prepaid at all? Well, if you look at the invoice, if we're paying on a month by month basis and the month we pay, is the same as the month it relates to, we simply write it off in that month. But when we look through the account, if the charges that we've got in the account relate to, pre to future months, so in other words, if we look at an expense, you know, and then we've written off the relates to say the three months for the, this month and the next two months, we would prepay that. And similarly, if what we've paid relates to a previous month, we'd be on notice that we probably need an accrual for the current month. Um, so there's one other thing with a couple of other computer expenses which might be relevant. What happens if you spend money on say a web server, a server host? Which month do you write that account? Which month should you write that off or, or accrue or prepay depending on what's happening? Well, if you've got server hosting, the, you always know which month the server is hosting you. So if the host is, if the server company is hosting you for the month of February, then that is the month in which the, the cost should be written off. So um, depending on where your invoice is, you might prepay it. So if your invoice in the month of February relates to uh, the, the server rental for the month of March, that would be a prepayment. If it's in the current month, you'd write it off. And if it's in the previous month, you think about accruing it. What about if you pay someone to create a website? 
So you pay them, say, £5,000 for creating a website. Should that be written off in the current month in the same way as your server is written off in the current month? They make the site live in the month of February. Should you write that off or carry it forward? And the answer to that is you treat it like a prepayment or a fixed asset, depending on the amount involved and depending on the life, depending on how long you think that will last. So if you've got a website and it's a really big one and that's going to last you two or three years, typically you treat that as a fixed asset. If your website's going to last you about a year, you probably treat it the, the part of it as a prepayment and write off the part of it that you've already used up and release the cost, release the prepayment each month, depending, depending on the month it relates to. So generally, web costs, if they're very small amounts, you would write it off. But if they're large amounts, you would carry it forward either as a prepayment or as a fixed asset. What about if you've got a website and someone tinkers with it? So they go on, you've got a website and you now want a new page put up or you want some text adjusted. Well, you could go through and carry that forward if you think that that cost has got a life that lasts for two or three years. But typically, it's very difficult to know how long individual adjustments relate to. So typically, we write off the adjustments in the month in which they were carried out. So the month in which the goods or services were received. So if someone comes through and updates that in and puts through an invoice for you in the month of March, and you pay that invoice in the month of May, the date in which you've received the benefits, the date in which the goods and services were provided with the month of February. So in the month of February, you set up an accrual. In the month of March, you'll set up the creditor and reverse the accrual. And in the month of April, you'll pay off the creditor. And that's how the month in which the service was received is distinguished from the month in which the invoice was raised, which is distinguished from the month in which the payment was made. But through all of that, you've accounted for it in the correct accounting period, which is the month in which the service was received. And generally, you wouldn't carry it forward if it's updating a web cost, uh, just updating a website, because updates tend to be smaller amounts and they relate to specific items. Um, and generally, you wouldn't think that that has got a useful life of long term in the future. But as an accountant, you can judge um, as best suits you. OK, a few more expenses. The next one is for charities. And again, what I'm trying to illustrate is the principles of the month in which an expense arises. So in this case, fundraising. When a charity goes out and raises money, um, it'll often spend money to raise money. So the challenge is, if I spend money in the month of January and the revenue I receive comes through in February, March and April, should I carry those costs forward as a prepayment to set against the revenues? That's the question. And the answer is, it depends how certain you are to get revenue and how closely linked the fundraising activities are to the revenue as to whether you can carry it forward. So as a general principle, if you go through a fundraising campaign and at the time you run the campaign, you have no idea how much your revenues are going to be, you have to write off the whole of the fundraising in the month in which you spend your, in which the activities, the raising activities take place. So if you're advertising, you're put through in the month in which the advertising takes place. If you're employing people to do a social media campaign, you write it off in the month that they deliver that service to you. Even though in February, March and April, you're gonna receive revenue, and you would say, well, look, should I match the cost? The answer is no, because at the, the end of January, you have no real way of knowing how much revenues are going to be generated. You might generate nothing. The only exception to that 
is if you know that the fundraising cost relates to future revenue. And an example of that might be if you're paying for venue costs to run an event in the month of, say, March, and you're going to sell tickets in the month of February and March, but you have to pay some money to the venue in order to secure the uh, venue, um, the venue itself. So you might pay fifteen thousand pounds to secure a venue. This would be a hopefully a very large fundraising event. It's a fundraising cost because the only purpose of this event is fundraising. That may not necessarily be the case. It could be we'll carry out some other charitable activities at the same time. But let's say this is entirely a fundraiser. In this case, because we know that the uh, fundraising is gonna take place in the month of March, we know we're selling tickets in the month of March, we need to defer the payment through, not because it matches against the revenue, but because the month in which we're going to receive the benefit of the venue is not January, but March. That happens to coincide with the revenues we're getting from the uh, from the um, fundraiser itself, but that's not the point. The point with uh, fundraising is you carry it, you carry costs forward, or you accrue for them so that you match them in the month in which the expense is incurred. The only time you match the revenue with the costs in fundraising terms is if there's a very explicit link between the revenue and the fundraising cost. And it could be, for example, someone has said, I'm going to reimburse you for uh, to carry out, to do a particular activity. I have to see you carry out the activity in the month of January, but I'm gonna reimburse you in the month of March. But in order to do so, you have to spend a bit of money in order to secure that revenue. In that case, I probably would match the costs against the revenues because I've got a contractual obligation. The fund fundraiser said, I'm going to guarantee that income contractually. And in that case, you could carry forward the revenue, uh, the costs to the revenue, um, even if the fundraising activity took place in a different month, but only because of the very explicit and contractual link between the outgoings and the revenues. So again, the purpose of this discussion was to make it a bit clear of this matching concept between cash outflows, services or goods received, and services or goods delivered, and how to match all of those respective things. The next one is a bit complicated, is bank loans and interest. The reason it's complicated is if you take out a loan for say 10,000 pounds and you have, uh, you have to repay the bank 200 pounds a month for the next however long, the complication is some of that 200 pounds you pay to the bank will relate to interest, but some of it will relate to a repayment of the loan. The only way you know how much is which is by asking the bank. It'll either be in the documentation or one way or another, you'll be able to find out. You might have to call the bank to find out. But let's say in the month of 1st of February, you take out a loan of £10,000. And at the end of February, you repay £200. When you make that payment, you credit bank. The question is, what would you debit? If you know at the time how much your loan and interest would be, you would debit the loan proportion to bank loan and the interest to the interest. But if you don't know at the time what it would be, you might put the whole of that 200 pounds through to either loans or interest, who knows which. But when you finally subsequently know how much the correct amounts are, you would put through a journal so if you put the whole amount through to loans, for example, when you found out how much the interests were, you put a journal through to reduce the amount of the bank loan that was put through and put the balance through to interest. So I want to just talk briefly about tax. We're gonna have a separate module on tax. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but typically with tax, you either pay it in advance or you pay it in arrears. Typically, that's what happens. So sometimes you pay month, uh, tax quarterly, and that relates to the quarter in advance. 
or quarter in arrears, depending on the type of tax, or you get to the end of the tax year, calculate your profits, find out what your total profits are, work out what your total tax are, and you pay your tax then, and you might have a whole year's worth of tax to pay. And depending on the period that the tax relates to, you might need to include a prepayment or an accrual. So if you pay your tax at the beginning of the quarter, for example, I know in America, they have a number of taxes where you pay quarterly in advance, uh, albeit an estimate, when you pay that amount, you go and identify how much you've paid, you'll identify whether part of that is a prepayment, and if it is, you'll put through a, pre a journal for prepayment in the normal way. Similarly with accruals, if, for example, you have corporation tax in the UK, you calculate the whole of your profits, you wait to the very end of your, your accounting year, calculate what your profits are, you've then got nine months to pay the, your corporation tax bill, but that corporation tax relates to the profit for your accounting year. So you've got a tax bill to pay, even though it's only due the end of nine months after the end of the year, it's a charge that relates to the income or profits for that year, for the financial year. So with corporation tax, you would accrue for the future liability because it relates to the year in which you're accounting. So just wanted to identify that if you understand what your taxes are, you may well have to prepay what you've prepay part of what you've paid or accrue for what you haven't yet paid. Statutory fees, these are fees that are charged by the government for complying with statutory rules. So for example, um, there's a in the in the UK once a year you have to pay an annual fee to confirm who your shareholders and directors are, and that's called an annual confirmation fee. And you pay the fee in the month in which you put through your confirmation. The question is, does that fee relate to the one month, because that's the month in which you paid for it, or for the whole year, because you it's an annual charge and you could argue you could carry it forward for the whole year? The answer is the choice is yours. You, there's arguments either way. Generally, I write them off in the month in which they're carried out because they're generally smaller amounts and I don't fiddle around with small, tiny amounts to, for prepayments and, or accruals. They don't really impact on what the, the bottom line profitability of a business is. So I don't waste time dealing with it. But if it was a very large amount of money, you could argue it should be carried forward because it's a one-off, an annual charge and re really relates to the whole year's worth of trading. Or you could say that's the month in which we've had to incur the audits or the test or the whatever the fees are. So that's the month in which we have to charge for it. Even if we pay it in a different month, it's the month in which that activity takes place. That's the key point. And you could argue either. The final expense is uh, charitable donations or commitments. And again, this is the matching concept. If you're, um, you, you donate money for charity, and in the month of January, you make a lot of profits, and let's say you've got a policy that you will donate 10% of your profits to charities each month. You don't know how much to donate for the month of February until March. So you can only make the donation in March, but it relates to the profits you made in February. The question is, should that be recorded as a cost in February against the profits or in March? Because that's the month in which you made the donation. And the answer to that is most probably you should make the charge in the month in which you make the donation. The month in which you make the donation, not the month it relates to. The reason is, it's simply a policy of how much money you donate to a charity to do it by reference to the profits. It's not a commitment. 
So if, for example, for whatever reason, in the month of March, you'd say, look, I'm not going to pay that money. I just don't have enough. No charity could come to you to say, I'm going to sue you because you said you were going to make your payment, but you didn't make it. You just say, I'm sorry, I don't have the money anymore. And you don't have to make the payment. So even though you're making the payment by reference to the February profits, you are actually making the donation in the month of March. What happens if you make the donation in March, but you make the physical payments in the month of April? Should you treat that as a March or an April payment? And the answer is, again, it depends on whether in March you've made an effective donation, which is unchangeable, and it's simply the cash flow that happens in, in April. So, so generally, when you're making donations to a charity, you don't have a fixed commitment. So if you wrote to a charity in the month of March to say, we're going to make a payment to you, it relates to our February costs, we're going to make a payment to you, but you actually make the payments in April. Even though you've made a moral commitment to the charity in March, you haven't made a legal commitment to them. So actually, again, even though you tell them about it, the donation is actually in the month of April. So with charity donations, typically the donation is the month in which you make the payment. Again, I wanted to highlight the matching concept as to where it rules the month in which you define an income or expense and the, the scope in which it doesn't rule it. So generally with expenses, you're trying to record the expenses in the month in which your goods or services are received. If those goods or services received relate to different accounting periods, you've got the techniques of putting through an accrual or prepayment so that you can get the expense in the correct accounting period. What about revenues? I'm not gonna spend long on revenues because revenues is simply the reverse of income other than to say that typically revenues, if you have revenues in a month that relates to future months, it's most likely because you're working on a contract and you're gonna be paid in a future month. So long-term contracts are part of stock and work in progress. And there's a separate module on stock and work in progress. And there's quite a lot of information there on how you account for it. But I did want to talk about gift aid, because again, it highlights the points about the matching. And this is the last point we're talking about in this module. But gift aid is a peculiarity to the UK tax, to the UK charity systems. And it works like this. If you make a donation to a charity, an individual makes a donation to a charity of say a thousand pounds, as long as that individual is a taxpayer, the, the tax authorities, the Inland Revenue, say we're going to give tax relief for that thousand pounds to the donor, but in a very strange way. Instead of reimbursing the donor to reduce their tax bill, we're going to give that tax to the charity. Really strange. There's some good logic behind it, but for this purpose, you don't really need to ask why. But it's simply that the tax relief is not given in monetary terms to the donor. Instead, it's given to the charity. So if you've got a donation of a thousand pounds, you have gift aid of 200 pounds, 250 pounds. Mechanically, this is what happens. The donor gives money to a charity of a thousand pounds in the month of, say, February. says to the Inland Revenue, I've received a donation of a thousand pounds, please give me back my 250 pounds. And if they put through the request in the month of February, it's quite conceivable they'll get the money in February. So it's quite conceivable that the money will come in in the month of February, in which case you record it in February. It's actually very simple, there's nothing really to talk about because the income has happened in the same month in which the goods or services were received, or the donation in this case was received. But what happens is much, much more common 
that you receive donations in the month of February and you only ask for it from the revenue in the month of March. So the donations come through in February, but the, the, the gift aid will come through in the month of March. The question is, should you match gift aid to the month in which you receive the donation in February, or the month in which you put through the claim, which is March, or the month in which you receive the money, which is April. And we've already seen in donations, when we donate money to somebody else, the answer in that would be April. But actually with gift aid, it's a different answer. Sounds a bit strange, but I'll explain the logic so you can see why. The answer is you account for it in the month in which you receive the donation itself, not the month in which the donation is committed to you, is the month in which you receive the donation. Because that's the point at which the inland revenue say that gift aid becomes an entitlement. And the reason you record it in the month of February is exactly that point about entitlement. It becomes an entitlement. Even if the tax laws subsequently get changed, the tax point at which you can claim gift aid is the month in which you receive it. In this case, is the month of February. So if for whatever reason, the government changed the rules, they changed the laws, you could actually sue the government to get your gift aid back because as at the end of February, the law says you can claim gift aid. So even though you put through the claim in March and you might physically receive it in April, it is actually a valid debtor at the end of February because of the legal entitlement to that money. So the journal entry for gift aid is, is at the end of February, even though you haven't received the money, you're going to de debit a debtor. You can create an asset and the debtor is called gift aid. You have a, a debtor, which is a current asset called gift aid and the income I can credit either to a, a, an income account, profit and loss account called gift aid, or I could just as easily call that donations. And what is happening on the credit side is the donation of a thousand pounds is being supplemented by gift aid of 250 pounds. So conceivably, you could argue that actually your donation, even though you received a thousand pounds, that donation was worth 1250 pounds. So you could easily have called that credit donations or gift aid in, in the income and expense side. I'm just gonna show you what that looks like in the accounting system. I should mention at this point, the gift aid is available to charities that have registered for VAT. So if you have registered for VAT and you're a charity in the UK, uh, this might be useful for you in practice even if you're not a registered charity and you haven't registered specifically for gift aid with the inland revenue, uh, this still might be interesting in terms of the accounting principles it uh, highlights. So I'm going to uh, show you how to record the donation and then the gift aid on it uh, so you can see what it looks like in practice. So we're gonna to go to quick entry. I'm gonna add uh, a receipt I'm going to give it a reference of 2103.7, and that will be a reference back to 74. That's a reference back to the document which confirms the receipt, where I got the receipt from, if there is one. Often with donations, you don't have receipts. It's quite frustrating. Sometimes you might just have to refer back to the bank statement. Um, so the account is donations received. That's the accounting entry. So we have credit, uh, debit bank, credit donations received. It's received from um, donation from ABC, or whatever the name of the donor is. The um, uh, date is the 11th of March. Let's say we received a thousand pounds and the goes into the bank account. So I'm gonna save this entry, which is because this money received, gone into the bank account, the entry will be debit bank a thousand pounds, credit donations received, because that's where we've entered it here. Let's see what that looks like first. A quick look at the profit and loss account.
The profit and loss account simply shows donations received of a thousand pounds. Let's look at the balance sheet. As we would expect, the balance sheet simply shows a bank account of a thousand pounds and net retained reserves of a thousand pounds. Okay, that's all that's expected. Now I'm going to enter a journal for the gift aid. The reason I'm doing a journal is that at this stage, there's no cash receipts. We're going to record the gift aid even before we've received the funds because the gift aid relates to that income. So in this case, we're going to show the gift aid debtor. This is money that's going to be due from the, uh, um, uh, revenue, the revenue of customs. I should say um, the reference um, uh, might be um, uh, 2103.74, I think it was, um, gift aid on donation. And I might say gift aid on donation from ABC. So that's the description we're going to put in. So the, um, we're going to show a debit of uh, the gift aid. This is money that the Inland Revenue owes us now that we've received the donation. And the amount, they, uh, the amount of gift aid on a thousand pounds of donations is 250 pounds. That's just based on the tax rates that have been set. So we're going to debit debtors, this, a special debtor gift aid of £250. What do we credit? Well, it's, it's like income. It's an addition to the donation we've received. So I can either call it donations here. I could either add it to donations received. Or... I could have a separate item if I want to keep track of gift aid separately, and I've got a separate item here, gift aid income, which is what I'm going to call it. It's give the same description as beforehand. And we're going to credit 250 pounds. The journal balances, so we can post it at save and close. So I've entered this entry, the gift aid on the donation. Let's have a quick look at the balance sheet, uh, the profit and loss account. So the profit account now shows donations received of a thousand in this month, also gift aid of 250 pounds. So my total income is 1,250 pounds. Whether I included the 250 pounds in donations or separated it out as a separate line for gift aid is really up to me as to whether I want to highlight gift aid as distinct from donations. And in some charities you would want to do so and some you wouldn't. That's not really the point I wanted to make. The point I wanted to make is that you're recording the gift aid in the same month in which the donation was received. You're recording the same amount of the donation was received, even though you may not have received the money this month, you'll most likely receive it next month or the month afterwards or sometime in the future. So let's have a look at the balance sheet. The balance sheet still shows the thousand pounds in the bank from the donation. It now shows a debtor of gift aid of 250 pounds. And if nothing else happens until the end of March, at the end of March, our balance sheet will show bank thousand pounds, gift aid debtor of 1250 pounds, the net profit, uh, the net retained reserve 1250 pounds. Our balance sheet balances, these two amounts are the same. So we're happy with that. And we've matched the gift aid receipt with the date in which we've received the donation using this debtor, using this journal. And of course, a month later or two months later when the funds come in, we'll simply put through a journal showing debit bank, credit the gift aid debtor, which will move this 250 pounds. By crediting the debtor, you reduce this down to zero. And by debiting it, you'll increase bank accounts to um, 1,250 pounds. Okay. So we've reached the end of this module. Uh, just to quickly summarize, the module is all about how you match expenses and revenues using accruals and prepayments. The accruals is how you bring expenses from a future period into a current period where the reason you need to do it is because you've received goods or services in this month, 
but you haven't yet paid for it in this month or received the invoice in this month. So your accrual brings it forward from future to the current month. And prepayments does the opposite. It looks at what you've paid or accounted for in the current month, but which relates to future months. And the prepayment is what allows you to defer it. So thank you for listening. I hope you've understood all of that. Until next time. Bye.